people live and breathe in their tiny little ecosystems and people live and breathe in their Facebook feed and they claim that they want diversity. But at the end of the day, the truth is that there's not much diversity in your Facebook feed because you're probably just following people you know, like and trust who are probably very close and or similar to you. And you need to be very cognizant of it as a business leader. You know, I never see things like that in my Facebook feed. Well, that's because your Facebook feed is limited to your own beliefs. Welcome to The Creator's Journey. I'm your host, Charles Gupton. Fears and obstacles on the journey of creation are things we all face. Every creator who works from the heart faces the same challenges. You're not alone. In each episode, I talk with creative leaders about the mindsets and processes they use to push through their struggles to create and put their work out into the world in order to make a difference. Thanks for joining me on this journey. I first learned about Mitch Joel while reading Chris Brogan's book, Trust Agents, and immediately bought and consumed Mitch's first book, Six Pixels of Separation. Then later, his 2013 release, Control-Alt-Delete, which was named one of the best business books by Amazon that year. Mitch is president and the chief media hacker of Miram, a global digital marketing agency operating in 20 countries with over 2,500 employees. Marketing Magazine has dubbed him the rock star of digital marketing and called him one of North America's leading digital visionaries. He's a columnist for the Harvard Business Review, Inc. Magazine, and the Huffington Post. After attending the very first PodCamp conference in 2005, he started his weekly podcast, also called Six Pixels of Separation, and has incredibly racked up over 500 episodes and counting. Mitch also produces a blog post nearly every day with a combination of original and well-curated content, and has done so for 13 years. But I don't feel like I can just end my introduction of Mitch without getting him to introduce himself as he asks each of his podcast guests to do so. So who are you, and what do you do? Well, thanks, Charles. I think you answered it perfectly. Um, my name is Mitch Joel. I'm the president of Miram, which is a global digital marketing agency that used to be called Twist Image. Changed a year ago as we grew and were acquired by WPP. And I also love to write and share and communicate with people. I've been a distant admirer for a while, but preparing for our conversation took me a lot deeper into your work and has been quite engaging and thought-provoking. So I appreciate the work you do. The very first question I have for you is, when do you sleep producing everything you're doing? I sleep at night. Um, <laughs> according to Fitbit, I sleep really well. I often like I don't understand that question often I get asked it a lot I think that you make time for the things that are important for you you do the things that you want to do I never saw writing or having conversations like this and publishing them as podcasts as work I consider them a gift and a blessing because I've been afforded a lifestyle that allows me to do that and to have a great lifestyle based on that I um enjoy being home. I have a very young family and I enjoy spending as much time as I can with them. And although there are many people who talk about the balance, I know by fact that I have that balance and I, I try and live my life according to that sort of choice. Well, you're one of the most prolific human producers of content that I've come across. Your consistency is just uh, encouraging and amazing to me. So, um, well, I, I usually ask most folks about books that have been influential, uh, but I usually wait till kind of near the end of the show. But since you're such a prolific reader, what are three books that have rocked your thinking over the last several months and why? Last several months? Um, that's a good question. I'm a big fan of 
anything that my buddy Ryan Holiday produces, and I'm loving his new book, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, I think that it really does speak to a counterintuitive way of thinking about how we see um, influencers and personal growth. And I think he did an amazing job with that book. I really enjoyed uh, the brand new book from Jonah Berger called uh, Invisible Influence, which will, is not out. It will be out really soon. Um, he His take on influence and persuasion and the ambiguity of, of what it means it was also just so cleanly and nicely written. Um, and I, I really liked, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a blank, uh, Disrupted. I really like Disrupted. I was pulling a blank on the title by Dan Lyons, which is a book that looked at um, HubSpot, not for whether or not it was true or false or perspective. I just thought it was very well written. It's very rare that I read a book and I, I laugh out loud. I'm a huge fan of HubSpot, actually. So there were parts and components of it that were definitely tough to read because I even knew the people he was talking about. But I, I did think that it, um, I like books that provide a different perspective and I felt that he did. That's great. I, I like to keep adding to my list and filling out the bookshelf. So, and I added a lot just through your, your conversations on your podcast as well. I just kept uh, adding up the Amazon list. You refer to yourself as a misfit. What makes you feel like a misfit? Were you teased growing up, or what was your your place for that? I, I I'm just like a metalhead punk guy, and I always liked things probably before they became things. Um, so I liked music, a genre of music, heavy metal and punk, before it was sort of socially cool to like it. I was very involved in, in martial arts and mixed martial arts, and really was was there prior to even the first UFC before it became this multi-billion dollar industry that it is. Even the internet and technology, I, I was using it when you got beat up for being a nerd or a geek. Not that I did. Um, and was I teased? I think everyone is teased. And whether you're teased or not, I, I think that everybody feels like they are in some way, shape or form, some kind of misfit. And good, you know, I think that's partially what makes me want to have a depth of conversations. And I know that that's probably directly correlated to my passion for writing because writing is is an isolation and allows you to be somewhat protected from uh, others and how others might perceive your thinking. And then once it's out there, you sort of bite your nails and hope you don't get uh, too many arrows, you know, shot into your back. Have you ever struggled with imposter syndrome? Are there places that you still have self-doubt about the work you're doing or anything that you're creating? I still have the imposter syndrome. I still worry that someone's going to walk into my office and be like, okay, we know it's up. You can leave now. And I'll be like, okay, you're right. And take my hat and put on my head and my trench coat and umbrella and walk out and, you know, sulk home in the rain. But I don't see that as a bad thing. I think that if anything, the imposter syndrome has driven me more than anything to to not want to have that and by not wanting to have the imposter syndrome i think that's the counterbalance is that i'm an infovore you know i just there's a lot of info and i'm just out there voraciously trying to capture it all so i don't see imposter syndrome in in my personal ecosystem as as a negative thing I, i've seen it as really being one of the driving forces that i'm so worried someone's going to find out i actually know absolutely nothing about anything that I'm constantly forcing myself to grow, learn, study, self-educate, and uh, and and be out there. And in part of the writing and content creation really comes from just the fact that that's to me is is the completion of the act of thinking and learning is producing. So I get up every morning and try to to focus a few hours each day with my reading time and writing time, and the voice in my head keeps. I mean, without fail every day, it just keeps asking, why are you sitting there doing that when you need to be doing something productive? And I just struggle with, is the value of what I'm learning and putting back out of value one of the great encouragements to me to keep doing it, to realize we all have a voice somewhere in there that comes out of the curation of what we're reading or putting together. Yeah, Susan Orleans, who's a great creative nonfiction writer and educator, has an amazing course on Skillshare. And uh, one of the standout components of that was she would she she said something like, "Reading is reading is learning. Writing is teaching." And I always love that full spectrum approach to it. So 
I don't look at reading as being time that could have been spent doing something else. I look at reading as being time spent prepping me to do the things I need to do. And that's just the only prism I add on to that thought. Absolutely. Well, since you've been blogging since 2003 and with nearly 520 podcast episodes under your belt, what do you see as the roles of those two media going forward from here? You know, podcasting is obviously still in its early days, I believe. I don't know if the adoption of that audio format has been accepted by the masses. And I think partially it has to do with Apple and the gateway by which iTunes, both on your mobile device and desktop, sort of underplays that media format. You have to sort of know where it is, find it and figure out how to use it. It's getting better and Apple's podcasting app certainly helps. But again, it's a standalone app. I still believe in the power of audio. I love podcasting because it's an alternative form of audio. I look at even my show that I do every week, and I just wonder if if other content like that exists somewhere where somebody has that sort of coffee shop conversation with somebody and and publishes it. I really like that because you can't do that on traditional radio, and I just think that the format is very, very opportunistic still. Like there's a lot of things that can be done with it. And I think, you know, again, you look at some of the breakout celebrities from your Mark Marin to your um, Joe Rogan and on. And I just love that sort of long form audio content. I love it. Uh, blogging, I think, is definitely changing because much like blogging was in day one, there's not one place where you write online. You know, Twitter is micro blogging is what they originally called it, 140 characters. You can post now directly onto Facebook. You can post directly on LinkedIn. You can post directly on Medium. Uh, all of them have similar underpinnings to what blogging is. So, you know, is the written word going to go anywhere soon? No. Um, is a blog more than just something on a WordPress uh, WordPress platform? Probably. Um, I think that all of them sort of change and evolve as people's desires and wants and shiny objects like Snapchat or whatever else comes into 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 focus. So I look, I think it's changing because it's just the nature that it has to change through technology. I don't think it's changing in the sense of I, I can't imagine a time when people don't want you know to read the written word in the, in the digital format that we're pr- producing them in. Through the process of the things you're doing, how has both the, the, the process of writing and the process of having those conversations uh, changed your observational abilities. I mean, what are the things that you can't help but notice because of that accountability to writing and, and producing? Yeah, I, I, well, I think there's something in there. Like, I wish I could produce more. At the, at the end of the day, I've got you know a, a, my pocket app stacked with content. I've got notebooks filled with ideas. And I just don't have a place for them. But you know, towards the end of the day, I'll say, well, what's what sort of what what percolated to the top? What's the one thing I want to share? And even even you know, in the editorial calendar that I've created over at Six Pixels of Separation, it's not necessarily always about writing. Like I know Monday is going to be, I do a weekly radio hit uh, on one of the larger radio stations up here in Canada. It's like a morning crew thing where I talk about digital, and so I post the you know, I embed the SoundCloud there on Monday. Friday, I typically post something about, you know, a video, a long form video that I saw that I think people should check out with a little bit of commentary on it. Saturday, I do a weekly link exchange with two longtime buddies of mine, Hugh McGuire and Alistair Kroll. And Sunday is when I publish Six Pixels, the podcast, you know, an hour long conversation. So even if I do nothing between Tuesday and Thursday, I don't feel terribly guilty because you're still getting, you know, what is it? One, two, three, four or five pieces of content for sure every single week. Um, and so for me, it's just a question of like, what makes it, what makes it, what makes it, what makes it to, to the radio thing? What makes it to a link I share? What makes it to me requesting a conversation with somebody for a podcast? Uh, it's more of that in my brain. It's not like, oh, what am I going to write? Like I never have that feeling of, ugh, what am I going to write about now? I never had it. I never had it. I haven't had it for 10 years. I never just never had it because I was a journalist. And in my early days in the late 80s of being a journalist, you know, it's, it's uh, as they say in French, it's chercher la femme. You know, you're always looking for, you're, you're always looking for something. You're always, you know, you're a bit of like a, 
that the skunk Pepe Le Pew and Bugs Bunny where it's like there's just all these scents and you're just you know you're like nose perks up and you sort of start following the scent and that's what what it is for me I just I don't have that I know where you're going and I think where you're going is that struggle that people have like oh what should I do today I don't have that because I have too much and I'm I'm just I just can't I can't even filter properly I don't think yet uh, what I should and shouldn't write about well, partly aware, but also just the observation, and you, you did answer at least what was on my mind, just what, what can you not help but notice. I mean, I started in newspaper work as well as a journalist, as a photojournalist, and a couple of the newspapers I worked at in the early days of my career, I had a lot of, of feature photo photos to shoot, just daily life kind of stuff to fill in holes in the paper. And I got to where I could produce three to five, six or seven a day because I was always looking for just that little human element. And I was having a conversation with a, a, a friend from years ago about that. And I realized I still kind of notice those things as slice of life images because I trained my, I was, my eyes just trained 30 something years ago to look for them. And in a sense, I can't not see them. But I don't see them the way I did then. Yeah, it's the same for me. It's very similar for me. I, I, you know, I used to be a music journalist, and I'd interview basically rock stars nonstop. And I'd do three, four, sometimes five a day. I'd see four or five shows a week. And while I definitely don't do anything like that now, if a week goes by where I didn't have that form of conversation with somebody, I, again, I feel like it, like similar to you. It's just part of my DNA. And if if I'm not, you know, I I don't read things and nod and go okay. I read things and as that sort of nose for news individual in me, I go, why? Why did that stick with me? What didn't I like about what bothered me? And even this stuff, as it, as it runs around, it's not like a set set of questions. There's there's a note that's jotted down or I'll save something with a tag on it in, in pocket to, to review later. There's just always something that I'm, I'm always – I always spend the time removing the content from my ingestion of it and wondering – what was it about it? And then is there is there a story there? And it's not always a story. It could be something for one of the clients here at Miram. It could be a pitch that I'm working on, and I just tend to be attracted to a certain type of post because I'm really focusing on a pitch or a piece of work that, that clients are doing. Or it could be just the industry that you know, one of our clients is in, and you sort of just become more – more open to hearing about that industry because you've been thinking about it or working on it. So it's all those sort of things that I don't always think everything's an output to be a blog post or a podcast. It's just something that I'm putting in my pocket as a piece of information that I may or may not use somewhere down the line. Well, drilling into that a little bit, uh, it seems to me that some of the best people I know that came into advertising or communications came out of journalism, especially small town journalism. Uh, what impact do you see the demise of newspapers or the reduction of newspapers, certainly, having on communications and advertising in particular, as well as social media and, and communications in general? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a complete disaster. And I, I say this with a, a sense of selfishness because I sit on the board of directors in full transparency of an organization called Post Media that manages, you know, several hundred newspaper brands up here in Canada and has obviously digital properties to match it. And it's not because of that role. That role is new. I only started in January 2016. Um, but it's because of my pedigree. And my pedigree is that people don't understand. Uh, and I say that you know, very directly, that they don't understand the merits and values of what a strong infrastructure on journalism, whether the output is a newspaper otherwise, means. And they think, well, it just, you know, these newspapers got disrupted. And now, you know, Vice and BuzzFeed and, 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 and Vox will take over. I don't know if they're really understanding their local communities all that well. If you turn on the radio or TV or even a local internet property, most of them start off with a line that goes something like, today in the Washington Post, today in the New York Post, today in the Vancouver Sun, today in the National Post, today in the Globe and Mail. And they are riffing and editorializing or, or taking – pieces of news and sharing them without realizing that there are journalists behind that who may have been spending weeks, months, days, minutes covering things that are happening locally. And if they believe really sincerely that having you know, somebody with uh, not, a, not a lot of experience coming into their local area and posting to a blog is going to be 
the savior of that information, they're sorely mistaken. I, I live in Montreal, and we happen to have a handful, very few amount of journalists who spend months looking at you know what the government has spent money on in terms of healthcare and infrastructure. And I don't know who's going to replace their ability to uncover stories like that. I often reminded to tell people the story of the movie Spotlight, which got a lot of attention. Right. I don't know. Can you name me another news institution that's going to have a bunch of journalists working for months to then give out the story of, you know, priests who are doing not nice things to young children? And 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 if you watch the movie, it's the infrastructure around it, right? Do you have the insurance to tell that story in case they sue? Do you have the ability to fight it? Do you have the knowledge and experience to not just go after the first story, but actually find out that all of these priests are doing and build the bigger story, not just go with the one? And how do you – there's a whole complex world around journalism and how stories get told that people very easily dismiss because, well, everything's online and it's free. And so, you know, I say this because I, I, I worry, I do worry that the, the institution will go away because people think it's like dead trees versus websites. And that's not the problem. The problem is who will do the work at your community? Absolutely. To me, it's not the media. It's the thinking and the, the basic journalism skills. It's something that I've, I guess, recognized through the years is that a lot of writers, a lot of 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 folks came out of school and cut their teeth working in small newspapers or news or small television or radio stations and they learned how to report and how to uh, fact check just ask more than one source they learned how to craft a story put it together you know small town editors help them craft their skills if you will it was a training ground for them moving up to larger institutions and it concerns me that a lot of people in the news now at least by my observation, have not learned some of those basic skills. And uh, it, it's more of a, like the social media skills that are being developed rather than good journalistic foundational skills. And, and what concerns me, Mitch, is, is where that's going to be going as we have fewer of the small town opportunities to cover. And, and, and the other thing is that the sensitivities and the empathy for what a story can do in your community if it's reported wrong, how it can hurt people. Uh, when you live in a community, you have some accountability that you may not if you don't know the people. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's very cogent. And I agree. The problem is you're talking to two people who have a passion, understanding, and have studied media. The, the issue isn't us. The issue is the millions upon millions of people who are like, <laughs> I don't need a newspaper anymore at my front door because I get everything for free on my mobile and not understanding the connection of what happens when that institution and infrastructure goes away and the erosion of what happens within the community. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I just really believe that I have not seen and I'm pretty astute on these digital channels. I just have not seen a duly implemented replacement for that institution yet. And I recognize on the other side that the institution that currently still does exist and is struggling along may not be the best solution either. Right, right. I hear a lot of talk about the need to develop your own distinct voice if you're going to stand out from – Kind of the masses of people in media. How do you define or describe your voice in your company? What what Miram stands for, but also what is Mitch Joel? Well, Miram is in and of itself a, a much bigger entity than one I could have ever imagined. This company started out as Twist Image in 2000, was acquired by WPP two years ago. And then within that institution, we took a bunch of agencies that were like us, geographically different, brought them together and about a year and a bit ago, rebranded as Miram, which is Latin for wonder and amazement. And I'm really proud of that organization. It's 3,000 plus people or 3,000 people. It's, you know, 20 plus, 25 plus, almost 30 countries that it's situated in. Uh, you know, we still basically, I say we, because it's, you know, Miram in Canada, Twist, the formerly Twist Image was four partners and one of four. And I think in terms of the voice and what we're about has been consistent. It's evolved because of the nature of what digital is, right? It's about how do people use technology and how do they connect and what can businesses do to make their brands connect to those people? And so that has sort of been there from, 
you know, 16 plus years that I've been doing this organization, this company. Uh, and of course, it evolves because of the tools and technologies and all the competitors that have come into the fray. My personal voice really has been just one of sitting next to you, showing you some of the things you may not have time, have had time to see, um, diving in it a little bit deeper, hopefully telling it and explaining it in a way that makes you empowered and makes you better um, and that isn't condescending and that isn't uh, making you feel like you're less than because you're not doing it. I, I know a lot of my peers like to scream and get angry and tell people how, how far, far behind they are and how woefully bad they are at things. You know, maybe it's just my age and my experience. I don't know that that helps. And so what I like to do is take an area and show them what the area means, why it's important, where the opportunity lies, and do it using fun and memorable examples. And that's really what it's about. You know, everyone talks, you know, just today I published a blog post about innovation. And it's basically just a link to um, an Elon Musk interview that he did at uh, Recode, the conference that was held recently in California. And the reason I posted it is because it struck me that, you know, here we are talking about marketing innovation and digital transformation, which are core pillars of the business that I run. And I then say, well, how many of how many people really are doing true marketing innovation? And if you listen to this interview and hear him talk about us becoming a multiplanetary species, his plan for Mars, autonomous vehicles, uh, artificial intelligence, and how he thinks and speaks, I don't know many leaders who are that innovative. But that to me sounded very innovation driven. So that's the sort of voice I want to give. It's a voice that doesn't say what you're doing is wrong or you're off or you're, you're crazy. You're not doing this. Look at what you're missing. But rather, here are some opportunities. You may want to add them into your toolbox. They might benefit you. They might make you better. They might make you think differently. Yeah, it seems like the, the number of people who change because they've been told they're wrong or not doing something well seems to me to be about exactly zero. Most people don't really respond well to someone screaming at them that their point of view or yeah, is not acceptable. We just seem to get more deeply entrenched. But those people do very well, and they have millions of followers and you know, give keynote speeches and have growing businesses and do well because fear is a great motivator. I just try not to use fear as the motivator. Oh, good on you. When people are talking about getting things done, they often talk about strategies and, and tactics to accomplish what they want to do. But there seems to be, in my mind, a lot of confusion about the two. Uh, whether it's in developing an international marketing initiative or even just somebody developing a, I don't know, a personal fitness plan. Can you talk about the differences between strategic and tactical thinking and any confusion that you see surrounding them uh, as it relates especially to marketing or communications? Yeah, I mean, it's something, I don't know if you're alluding to this because you read Six Pixels Separation, but it's something I've been speaking about for almost well, over 10 years. And it's nothing, I don't think it's even original. I probably stole it from somewhere. I just wish I could remember who and I would tell you. The way I define strategy versus the tactics is the why versus the what. You know, what are we going to do on YouTube? What are we going to do with Snapchat? That to me, what is the very tactical question. Why should we be on YouTube? Why should we be on Snapchat? Why should customers buy from us? I think why questions are very strategy-based and what questions are very tactical-based. So when, whenever the question becomes, well, what should we do here? I don't think it's a strategic conversation. I think it becomes a tactical one. Why should we, I think, is where the strategy lies. So that's my very simplistic definition of it is strategy equals why, tactics equal what. Good. That's, that's tight. From the vantage point of your awareness of so much media, what are the platforms that creative leaders need to be aware of or at least strongly considering uh, to have an impact with the work they're doing? Anyone that answers their why. And that's just the simple truth about it. I think that you are – you don't have to be on Snapchat to study Snapchat. So I think there's always an opportunity to understand these emerging platforms and their, their stellar growth, Snapchat obviously being one of them. I don't think that this misses the fact that a leader shouldn't understand what Twitter is or what YouTube is or what Facebook Live could look like or LinkedIn or on and on. So I, I always think there's, there's two sides. One is a general understanding. I want to be young. I want to be in touch. I want to understand things that might help me be better as a professional. So that's just playing and tinkering and reading and fooling around with all of those. And then there's the why stuff is really what what is going to drive the business or what should I be trying that I hope will have some form of business result. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. No, 
No, absolutely. Are there mindsets that people need to consider or, or develop as we're moving into a new or different media landscape? How the mindsets needed to shift in the last 10 years and where are they going to be more effective? I mean, I think it's, uh, I'll probably have a very simplistic and tight answer again, which is open. It's just an open mindset, open infrastructures, open ideology, open thinking, open diversity. I think open is a very powerful place to be because you can, if you're more open, you can accept more inputs. My concern really is that people live and breathe in their tiny little ecosystems and people live and breathe in their Facebook feed and they claim that they want diversity. But at the end of the day, the truth is that there's not much diversity in your Facebook feed because you're probably just following people you know, like, and trust who are probably very close and or similar to you. And so there's actually in all of this connectivity and all of this growth, there's actually been a sort of inverse effect or the, the, the famous filter bubble as well is happening too. And you need to be very cognizant of it as a business leader. You know, I never see things like that in my Facebook feed. Well, that's because your Facebook feed is limited to your own beliefs. Yeah, that, that uh, we're of one mind there. What I have intentionally tried to do for the last several years is tolerate the extremes. There's sometimes they, they get a little uh, annoying to me, but I've been pretty pleased, if not proud of, having people at the extremes of politics and a number of issues, I do want to listen to them because I want to understand where people are and why. Because there seems to me to be a lot more that those people have in common, but they're not willing to put down the things that they don't share to bridge that chasm and have a conversation. So my, my fear is not having people that I don't agree with in in my feed if anything that's fair but, but it's yeah it's fair it's the, the issues that you're you're somewhat again uh, you're probably more sophisticated than the average bear and the, the challenge is how do we educate others to understand and recognize they need some of that in their feed well i don't know that i'm sophisticated as much as i am just curious and you know how do you have a conversation with someone if there are no touch points to uh yeah to start with i've looked at, at facebook in particular and and some of the other social media as being, uh, I call it permissive stalking. Um, people put stuff out there that give you permission to know, and, and they're good conversation starters when the opportunity arises, um, as opposed to weather or, or something else. So you've had a lot of conversations. It seems like big data is on your mind a lot. Uh, it certainly has been on mine as I work with clients and, and hear how they're trying to pull data together. But it seems to me that a, a lot of, of things are getting overlooked or missed with, with consumers' lives and connection points uh, in that process of focusing on, on big data. Uh, Want to share some of your, your thoughts, kind of you've pulled together uh, so many conversations in that area. Uh, what's being missed? What needs to be focused on uh, a value as opposed to just – loads of one night stands um you know how do we pull how do we use big data in a way or how can big data be used in such a way that it benefits uh, both consumers and and sellers of, of services I, I have nothing against big data i i question whether or not many businesses are truly doing it whether many question i question whether or not many businesses really understand the definition of it my definition of big data or big data, depending on if you like Star Trek or not, I guess, is <laughs> basically large data sets that exist in disparate databases within the organization that are now being accessed and leveraged through speedy processors that we never had access to before and that are able to parcel and package it together and repurpose it and give it back to us, the human beings, in a way in which we never could manifest it with just our own little human brains. And so do I believe that these amazingly brand new insights that we could never have fathomed are coming out of these CPUs and being used to market to us? Yeah, I, I do believe that that's probably happening in, in certain spheres of the world. Do I think that Every single brand, along with their IT department, have developed and deployed a very smart strategy around implementing big data for customer acquisition, increased revenue, et cetera. No, I just, I just don't. 
And as someone who gets to not just stand up on stage and speak to audiences, which is something I do, you know, 50 to 60 times a year, I also get to sit in audiences and watch many, I guess, build as important, smart people talk about big data when what I feel like they're really talking about is the fact that they have a lot of data. And a lot of data is not the same as big data. A lot of data is a lot of data. That's a good point. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're able to use technology at a speed of which to provide something unique, different that you couldn't have accessed before. And that's more of where my, you know, my the, the grinding of my gears comes from when it comes to that. Well, I think of a collection points for for data, and I mean, I'm I'm still amazed that I will look at some site and within the minute it seems like it's pop, popping up on a Facebook feed, that item, um, I mean, I, I'm still wowed by how fast it flips back in front of me to buy in another place. I mean, I look at a pair of shoes and I suddenly have six or eight or ten you know, ads for things popping up right there. If you were just starting to establish your work today, but you know what you know about the media landscape, what platforms would you choose to build your credibility and have the most impact going forward? I don't look at things by platform. I look at things primarily by what's going to move the needle the most. So depending on what my need was at the current state, I would be going where I felt I could just get the most bang for my buck in terms of time, energy, and effort. So I don't really look at it like, you know, you, you got to do this or you got to do that. I think clearly there are 800 pound gorillas in terms of, you know, Google search and Facebook advertising. But uh, in terms of actual content against effort, it would just depend on what I'm trying to accomplish. You made a point in Six Pixels that because of our connection through technology, we don't need introductions to other people in order to connect in the same way that we once did. But it seems that as a result of all the noise, at least to me, blowing around at people, that the suspicion about unvetted people consuming our time, or even worse, that we need old-fashioned introductions even more than today. Any thoughts in your mind updating that or any thoughts that have changed? Well, I don't think I, I don't think that's directly what I meant. What I meant to say is that in a world where we have so much connective technology and social networks, that our ability to be connected to anyone in the world has basically vanished. Right. That, that, that has nothing to do, I mean, that's like saying, you know, the ability for anybody to have an idea and publish it to the world for free is there. It doesn't mean the whole world's going to see it, care about it, share about it. So, no, I, I, I would never diminish the value of pressing the flesh or having a better curated relationship with others. The point was simply that in a world that we have developed, anybody can connect to anybody. Well, any ideas about uh, how to stay current in the minds of community people that you want to stay in an engaging way in a in a world where if you sign up for a newsletter or you any overture at all of connection, it seems like you get on mailing lists and people just pummel you with stuff. Any thoughts of of how to use the space that's there to connect from your viewpoint uh, in ways that are more meaningful without either feeling inundated or inundate other people with our our message or content. Well, the beauty of the new world is that I don't, you know, that, that pummeling feeling that you're feeling, I don't experience that. I think that if a brand is pummeling me, I unsubscribe and off I go. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the connections I've made in particular through email uh, and that channel. The ones that are creating that terrible experience simply are, are using a, a very sort of broadcast push based mindset versus the ability to create more personalized, customized, relevant experiences. We have all the information we need in terms of people signing up and what they're looking at, where they're going from there. Uh, if brands use that, they'll benefit from it. And if they don't, they'll experience fatigue and unsubscribers and they'll experience a very terrible outcome for what is, I think, one is still one of the most powerful channels out there. Yeah, Absolutely. I do get pummeled, it feels like, a lot from people that have information that I am interested in, but just not at the fire hydrant rate that it seems that it comes from them. So it seems to be all or nothing. Unsubscribing will teach them the lesson, Charles. That'll <laughs> – as much as uh, my unsubscribing is going to have an impact on them. It will. It does, it does lessen the impact on my, on my uh, inbox, though. That's true. Sure will. When uh, a creator – or an innovator is in uh, the dip or a thrash of getting their work into the world, uh, thinking either you know slow and long term versus having an immediate impact. 
You said that slow is one of the best kept secrets of successful business. Do you want to unwrap that a bit more in terms of kind of a process mindset versus a results oriented mindset? Yeah, it takes a lot to get people to care about you, your work and what you're trying to produce. And if you come to it with the mindset of it's going to take a long time to get people to care and and, and connect to what I'm doing, you put more time and effort and energy against it. And we tend to think that digital is fast, immediate and now. And it is, but I actually really believe from the other side that the opportunity is to take your time and to build that credibility and build the value and build the connections and build the networking. And to me, that's what makes uh, digital such a powerful channel. Uh, I want to move a little, well, kind of turn a little bit more to a little bit about your processes since you travel so much and are speaking and on the move a lot. I'm fascinated by a regular feature that the Wall Street Journal usually has called what they carry it has a a picture of what that uh, that featured person is is takes with them as well as kind of what what and why they use it kind of must always have with them when they're traveling are there any tools that you absolutely have to have or rely on when you're traveling or on the go i mean what tools do you find most useful to allow you to be mobile in your work as well as the mindsets that you use to get the most out of your tools. Look, if I have my MacBook Air and my iPhone, I'm good to go. I mean, that's pretty much, yeah, there's other sort of fun little things you pick up along the way. But, you know, 100% of my work is done on my iPhone or my MacBook Air. So as long as I got that, I'm good to go. Any any fun little things that others might go, wow, that's that's a great thing, something that you've come to enjoy using? I mean, look, I do a lot of presentations, and I'm a big f- yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do a lot of presentations, and I'm a big fan of the Logitech remote presenters. Uh, so that's one thing. Instead of sort of standing at my computer and clicking from slide to slide, or, or or using one that they give you on the road where you present, I tend to have that with me, which I I, I love dearly. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I don't know if there's anything all that sort of like wacky and different than the standard fairy. You know, backup backup hard drive that I you know a little external hard drive that has a carbon copy of my my drive in case something crashes. I tend to keep things as light and simple as possible. I like to travel light so I can move fast. So what are some of the processes that you have in place for taking care of yourself and of your, your physical, emotional, since, again, being on the road, back home, dashing out again? Are there any consistent processes that you use or practices? Uh, I don't know if there's anything that sort of uh, has an application towards what I do in my professional life. I try and get home as quick as possible. I've got a young family and I try, if I am in the city and not traveling, I try and be home for supper there. Uh, You know, when I'm on the road, I just make sure that uh, I, I tend to walk a lot when I'm on the road to sort of stay active and stay moving. Yeah, I don't know that there's anything in particular in terms of that that adds any merit or value to the output of, of my work. Um, you know, try and eat a little bit healthier than average. Try to get rest. Uh, try and make sure that I've booked a lot of meetings and networking opportunities. And, you know, just in general, try to make sure that if I'm going to be away from family or the office, that it's a value and that the time is being well spent. Yeah, that's important. I had a, a client that I worked with years ago in, in advertising, and he often flew in and out the same day anywhere he was, if if possible, because he just hated to be away from home. And when I was younger, I didn't get that as much. But the uh, to be back in your own bed, at least from his perspective, to be back in your own bed and just take care of yourself rather than wearing down over time, um, I think is, at least for me, as I got older, I began to feel those effects more and appreciate the, the need to get back quickly for your own good. I've been doing that for over a decade. Yeah, me too. Yeah. What is one of your more memorable client campaigns over the years based on what you learned about process, either refining your process or learning, yeah, just process mentality? You know, it's it's hard to pick one. We've been doing this for many, many years, over 15. Um, we've been very process driven from day one on both what the client is interacting with from a project management office from PMO side, from a CS client services side, to how we operate the business from the operations side in terms of the technology we use and the infrastructure we use to be as efficient as possible. And obviously by being efficient, that's where you make better margins and stuff like that. So it's hard to like align a particular campaign that had a process. I think things go off the rail and sometimes they don't or how much they go off the rail. And it's how you mitigate the risk and work through it. But I don't think that you would be able to align 
that type of thinking to the success of a campaign. Obviously, our preference is to work within the parameters we established before with the clients and have approval on, but things always go you know, a bit kooky and crazy. Um, but it, again, it's, it's just hard because we've always been very process driven here. So it's, it's a sort of core to what I think is our, our success. Well, I guess from that perspective, what about your processes have changed through the years in terms of what you've learned that if somebody was starting an agency, starting out now, and you had a, a word of counsel or some some counsel to give them in terms of what they should put in place? Two, financial and time management. This is a, you know, the business model of what we do in the agency world is pretty simple. We sell a human unit at a time for more money than we pay for it. It's a game of very tight and tough margins. And so what if you're not dealing with it from an accounting and operations standpoint in a very sophisticated and smart way? And two, if you're not measuring it in terms of what the effort and time is that your team's putting into it, that's where things typically fall down. So for me, it's those two parts of the business. Pretty straightforward. When is the last time that you've had a significant paradigm shift in your thinking? And what was it? I think the latest one probably came a bit over a year ago when I realized that this game of getting people to go to the blog or go and grab the podcast has inverted. And now people are going to stay on Facebook or they're going to stay on LinkedIn or they're going to stay on Twitter or Snapchat. And the question for me became less about how do we make six pixels of separation a hub and everything else spokes and invert that to be how do we make all these other channels hubs, knowing full well that six pixels will become some form of living and breathing archive slash referral for that, but not the destination anymore. Hmm, good point. Before I, I lose you or our time gets away, talk with me a little bit about Groove, the No Trouble podcast. How did that come to come about and where is it going? Well, I've been having a, a real hoot doing the Groove podcast. Uh, it came about – uh, actually, during a conversation I had in New York City with Seth Godin, we were having coffee, and I was telling him how I was not only back into sort of caring more about music, in particular the electric bass, and he mentioned that uh, Corey, Corey Brown, who had uh, was his partner in Squidoo, was also the founder of the site NoTrouble.com, which happens to be the largest site for bass players, and being a bass player, player and less of a player, more someone who knows how to play bass and just loves the music and those types of musicians, I said, hey, I'd love an introduction. I actually know that site really well, and I had no idea that it, that was the same Corey. And we just hit it off. Corey was a fan of Six Pixels of Separation. I told him that I felt like there was not a lot of content in the world about these amazing musicians who've done amazing things. Most of the articles and podcasts and stuff with those artists are about you know their technique, what gear they use, what riffs they play, but not about the artist and their desire to create music or be a musician or be an artist. And we just sort of went down this road of imagining what if we did a sort of six pixels but with bass players. And um, we were very fortunate because of the relationships they have to get Robert Trujillo, who was the bass player Metallica, on the first show. And at the time, Robert was promoting the infamous Jacko Pastorius documentary, which is now available on Netflix. And Jacko is basically every bass player's hero. And that led to just opening up a Pandora's box of people to speak to. We've been doing the show. We do a show every month, first Thursday of every month we publish it doing it for over a year and a half. And uh, I, you know, my, my sort of meta goal with it is to try and create the largest oral history of electric bass players uh, in the world. And it's uh, obviously a goal that will never come to, to see its end, but it's just <laughs> been a lot of fun. I, I, love, I, love, I love speaking to people like that. And you know, over the years, it's, it's just been an amazing group of uh, artists that I just never thought would, you know, from Tony Levin, who's played with, with Peter Gabriel, to uh, Leland Sklar, who's been with uh, James Taylor and Phil Collins. It's just been an amazing experience. Well, I think about the power of drilling down deep and narrow into the vein of one community and, and building that community where no one had recognized them before as being a powerful example of building community. So I was a bit amazed and hadn't really thought of that community and how you were bringing a service to it. What do you want to be remembered for? That's a tough question to ask. I still really I, – I love that Jeff Bezos from Amazon line about it's day one. So I hate thinking about what I want to be remembered for because I just feel like I haven't done anything yet. And it's day one and there's so much more to get done. So I – I, I don't I, – I, I'm not trying to ev evade the question or avoid the question. I just – I don't like thinking about what I want to be remembered for. I, I'm really worried about what I'm going to do after I get off this podcast, to be honest, and what stuff I need to get done. Um, so I don't worry about what I'm going to be remembered for. I worry much more about what I got to get done. 
Fair enough. Is there someone you know who's outside the spotlight but doing something important, uh, huh. having an impact that the world should know about? It's hard to say. You know, I look at friends of mine like Ryan Holiday, who just released an amazing book called Ego is the Enemy. And I think a lot of people know who he is, but I think a lot more people should know who he is. At the same time, I think about people like, you know, Jonah Berger's got his brand new book, Invisible Influence, coming out where, where he's contagious. And a lot of people know who he is, but I think a lot more people should know who they are. So I think the world is funny like that. I'm probably saying names where people are like, oh, I wish I, I know who that is. But I don't know. I look at them and think I, I think they should be probably you know more infamous and or famous. So. You know, there's a, a whole a slew of great people in our world from Nancy Duarte, who's just oh, wow. an amazing yeah. person talking about presentation skills to, you know, Todd Henry, who's doing amazing things in creativity to, you know, just, I mean, I could go through the list of all the people that I know and think they should be David Berkus and, you know, uh, Michael Bungay Stainer. I mean, there's so many people that I know and that I love and I think are so big because they're in my orbit, but they're not necessarily in other people's orbits. So, I could literally probably do go through my 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 Kindle list of all the of authors and people that I just know respect and, and think why well, they should be a lot bigger than they are. Well, fair enough. Well, that's part of the reason I ask the question. Sometimes people answer with, uh, "I wish people knew my parents better," or somebody else will will pick up somebody obscure. But again, there are. It's amazing to me when I'll just name influences, you know, people that I'm reading to other folks and. They just shake their head with, well, who is that? So I asked the question because I want to get more of that spotlight on people based on who the, who's had an impact on you as well. So Cool. Uh, fair enough. What is one thought that you'd like to leave with listeners that you believe could make a difference in their lives? I love the line that my uh, business partner often tells me. He used it for, for many decades. He's the CEO here at Merriman County. His name is Mark Goodman. And it's not his line, but it's a line that he would often tell junior people when they would come in and have to present to him. He would say, be brilliant, be brief, and be gone. That's quotable. That's good. Thank you. Mitch, I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you much. Thanks for listening to The Creator's Journey. If you enjoyed our theme music, the name of the song is You've Got a Home by Krista Wells. The Creator's Journey is published the first and third Sundays of each month, except for July and December. If you enjoyed the show, I would appreciate having you go to iTunes and subscribe. While you're there, if you give us a favorable rating and review, it'll make a huge difference in helping a newcomer easily find it. You can find links to today's guests, the people and books we talked about, and email me with your wonderful thoughts, all at thecreatorsjourney.com. I want to thank Yodelus for sponsoring this episode of The Creator's Journey. Yodelus is an interactive marketing platform for people in the creative world. With a vetted database of contacts from across the industry, Yodelus helps photographers, illustrators, creative directors, designers, producers, stylists, and many others to locate potential clients and gives them the tools to make those connections happen. If you want to find out how Yodelus helps creative people find one another for work, just go to yodelist.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash TCJ. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Here's a short excerpt from the audiobook Control-Alt-Delete, both written and read by my guest Mitch Joel. Enjoy! How often have you had the feeling in the pit of your stomach and suddenly it's tunnel vision? You have to go. Now. You need a bathroom. I'll spare you the details of my sometimes sensitive stomach scenarios, but as someone who travels over 100,000 miles every year, I can tell you that finding a clean bathroom is often a source of concern. I'll do my best to wait until I'm in the comforts of my hotel room or make a lunge for the airport lounge, but if you ever find yourself in the middle of New York City and nature calls, what are you going to do? Enter Sitter Squat. Laugh all you want, but Sitter Squat resides on my iPhone's homepage. The app allows users to find clean bathrooms, along with changing tables, handicapped access, and other bathroom features with ease. 
By knowing your phone's location, the app quickly shows you how close you are to a clean public restroom and a map on how to get there. It's a wiki-like platform where the content and ratings are governed by us, the loyal users. You can rate, comment, and even add the toilets of your choice. In March 2009, P&G's Charmin launched a global sponsorship of Sitter Squat, and by the looks of it, the toilet paper brand has backed the winner. Because when most people talk about Sitter Squat, they're also talking about Charmin. Charmin, a toilet paper company, is giving their consumers a true utility. In short, and to me, the app is a total win-win.